Hello, class. Um, welcome. Um, I have Miss Cherie Ellis Young on the on the video with me today, and she is the owner of Take Aim Axe Throwing in North Little Rock. And I want her to share a little bit about what her business does, and then talk a little bit about the company. So, if you would mind, introduce yourself to the class and tell us about what you do. Thank you, April. Um, as April said, my name is Cherie and I own Take Aim, which is a recreational axe throwing spot in North Little Rock, right um, one block from Main Street in Argenta. Um, and like I said, what we do, we offer an opportunity for you to come throw axes with your friends, with your company, for team building, um, with family. We host birthday parties, a host of, of activities. And it's just what it sounds like. So imagine darts but with axes, actually hatches. So we have a couple of different sizes. We have a 12 inch and I believe a 16 or 19 inch axe that you um, are able to throw. So you don't need to bring anything, just come and we go over a little safety talk and we get you throwing. Well, you need masks too, because COVID, yeah. Um, where did you come up with this idea? Like, did you just wake up one morning and want to start throwing axes or what? Right. I get that question a lot. And no, I did not. I had never thrown an axe until spring break of 2019. So my family, when I take my girls out of town, we have a little family rule. We always do new things wherever we go when we go out of town. No need to do the same things we can do at home, right? So for that particular trip, we went um, indoor skydiving, which was amazing. And we went axe throwing, and which I didn't even know was a thing, right? So I'm looking for things to do out of town. And I say to my girls, hey, you guys wanna throw some axes? That's weird. And because they're always down, they're like, yeah, let's go do that. And um, the first day I called, ironically, April, they were like, sorry, we're booked up tonight. I'm like, that many people are throwing axes that you're booked up? So it took two days. It was two days from when we wanted to go that we were actually able to get in. I walked into this facility that was in a, I would say a fairly um, emerging community. It wasn't quite bells and whistles community. It was emerging in Dallas and I was shocked. I saw young people, old people. Um, I saw um, all races. I saw people in suits and tennis shoes. Like maybe they just came from work. I saw people in casual spring break stuff like us. And I was like, wow, what a nice mix of people, which for anyone who knows me knows that's kind of my thing, um, um, places and situations that encourage diversity. So that's the first thing I noticed. But then I went to pay for this ax throwing and then end up paying like $65. And I was like, I literally am about to pay $65 for us to throw axes and there's nothing, nothing in this room but cages and wood and axes, like, and so I started counting the room, like counting the people and adding up the numbers. It's like, wait a minute, I need to check this out. And so I went home, I went to the hotel that night and researched um, the industry of axe throwing. And if you go to the World Axe Throwing League website, you will see hundreds of facilities around the United States, hundreds. And so I was shocked that I had never even heard of it because there are literally hundreds. And that's just with that one particular governing body, because there's also the X, um, the International Excellent Federation, so a whole different governing body. But anyway, from there, I said, well, we're in the capital city. I think I could do this. I, I, I'm telling you, it was really that simple. I added, I saw the numbers, I saw the opportunity, and I thought, let me do some research when I get back home. And so from there, I started looking at space and land and talking to city planning and city council, and it was just a whole thing. It was obviously more than what I thought it would take to bring a business and get it off the ground. I was rather clueless, but I've always been an opportunist, opportunist so, you know, and I'm not scary, so. So in the city, I'm sure there's some buildings that wouldn't want you throwing axes in there. So yes. you've got to the, find the right place, I guess. That was the first challenge. And it was difficult because when I went to city planning, since there was no, ax throwing was not in any zoning books in our area. So they didn't know where to place it. They were like, well, maybe it needs to be with the gun range in the gun zoning range. Well, it's not that loud right. or that the risk factors. Well, we don't want it in commercial one, two or three, which is like strip malls, recreational, uh, and, you know, like uh, commercial strip mall areas. They're like okay. C1 to C3. They didn't want it there because it would be too noisy, disruptive, whatever. And so we went back and forth and I think uh, it ended up being in C6, 
but I couldn't really um, look at rental uh, real estate until I knew where the zoning would fall. Okay. And then there was a lot of steps to get to that point because they ha I had to petition city planning and city council to even get in the zoning books. And so what I ended up doing was finding a space that's zone I-1, which is industrial one, and I applied for a variance. So he did, did not have to change his zoning for me to be there, but my variance allows me to be there. And then when, when take aim, if take aim ever leaves, he keeps his I-1 zoning, which is in everyone's best interest. It was a lot of, so much more than I could have ever imagined, yeah. So I think zoning for me mm -hmm. personally, I think it's a lot larger beast than what we realize. It is. Um, in fact, I'm familiar with commercial zoning and things like that. I'm not familiar with the one that you just talked about. It. I-6, is that what you said? I-1. I-1. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it makes complete sense the more I think about it. But I think sometimes when we're starting businesses, we don't realize how in-depth that we need to get with stuff like that too. Um, were there fees associated with changing that variance or do you just yes. apply? Yes, there are fees. You have to send a certified letter to um, every business owner within a property owner, rather, within a 200 foot area of your building to make sure they're okay with you being there. Okay. They had two weeks and they could have shown up to the meeting to, um, uh, what's the word, reject the idea. Okay. And if they had, then I probably wouldn't be in that space. Um, and it had to be a the, the list had to be a certified list. So you had to go through the, oh, the title company. So mm -hmm. I couldn't just go through and get that information. It had to be a certified list from the title company. And so it was, it was just a lot of moving pieces that I could have never planned for. And it, was, it wasn't super expensive, um, but the list alone would have been a couple of hundred dollars. But I had uh, the own, well, I knew someone who was able to help me take care of that. That's so I did, yeah. So I did not have to cover all of the expenses associated with that. Yeah. So you throw an axe for the first time and think, yes. I think I want to start one of these. You figure out that it's not that easy, mm -hmm. but at the end of it, on the inside of your building, there's really metal cages, yes. wood, mm -hmm. and that's about it. And right. that's about it. That's about it. Yeah. Where do you source Tables. your materials? So I really try to get everything I need for take aim locally. I didn't start out that way, but as a, as a new business owner, I realized I have a, a, I think a more keen sense now of small businesses and what it takes, you know, and I just want to support them. So my wood comes from, I started out getting it from Home Depot. Okay. And out of necessity, I had to stop going to Home Depot because the wood wasn't, I mean, I, the wood wasn't cut properly and I couldn't get resolution. But a friend of mine told me about a, a, a business that was a family owned called People's Brothers. So I, I get my wood locally in North Little Rock. I, you know, the signs you see up inside, um, that's local. The fencing was a North Little Rock company as well, Arkansas Fencing Guard Rail. The tables were built by a local um, entrepreneur, small business, he, he's a woodworker. So literally the fire pit was built by uh, a colleague that I work with, um, who's also a small business owner. So literally everything in there, other than maybe the floor mats, um, was That's all awesome. locally owned. I mean, locally owned purchased. So you said somebody that you work with, uh, what yes. the students may not realize is, is that you actually have kept your full-time job. Yes. How hard is that to negotiate all of that together? Like just making it work. It is rather complex and it's evolving. I feel like I'm settling into this chaotic normal, like mm -hmm. organized chaos. I think at the beginning, I felt like I was a little crazy. But um, one of the things I did, I wanted to, small businesses, I don't, I don't know the percentage, I bet you do, but several of them fail within the first couple of years, right? Close, close to 90%. Yes. And so I, I, I wanted to give, I wanted to protect Take Aim, right? I wanted to Take Aim to have enough money to be able to support itself without me pulling from it. So mm -hmm. that's why I wanted to keep my job. I wanted to have a surplus um, of at least a year, which end up being, even though I didn't reach a year surplus, the surplus I had really came in helpful when we had to be closed um, this summer. So, but I started with part-time hours and Take Aim is still only open part-time. So during the week, it's by reservation only. 
and then Friday nights and Saturday nights were open six to ten. And, and then, I have another person who works for me. Okay. And okay. so he covers the hours that I can. So that's helpful. So you're not open from you know ten to midnight every day or anything like that. No. You're you're open after be. you get off work, actually. Yes, six to ten. Um, and when people call me and say, hey, um, I want to come throw tonight, I, I say six o'clock. Now they say, oh, is there any way we can do five? I make five work. The reason why I leave that cushion for me is because I do have two children and I like to go home, check on my kids, make dinner. I do all of that before I go um, um, to the business. And so most of the time it works or I get, you know, like I said, I have one other person who works with me. He covers those hours, but he's not looking for a lot. So, right. When did you actually open? When was the first day? It was August of 2019, and you would think I would have that memorized. I believe it was August the 3rd of 2019. Okay. If, that, if that was a Saturday, then it was August the 3rd. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did you have people out the first day? Like, was that? Friends and family, mostly. Okay. And I had actually run an ad. So a couple of things I didn't do well. And this is a marketing class, so you guys will probably um, appreciate this. In all of the finding the land and, um, and getting um, waivers and legal documents and business structure and supplies and build out and con uh, contractors to come in there because that it didn't it didn't look like that when I what you see now is not right. what it looked like. Um, I did a very poor job with marketing. When I got my business license June sixteenth, I should have hit the ground running with marketing, and it was one of those things that I let drop and so. When you do get a bit, when you get a business license, you get a lot of solicitors. Like I had newspaper, radio, all these people calling me. I had no idea which medium was the best to advertise for. And so when it got close to time to open, like maybe the month before, I just said yes to whoever called and wasted a whole bunch of money. I'm just going to be honest with you. Okay. And when it was all said and done now, all I do is social media marketing. Okay. Uh, radio ads are crazy expensive. They are crazy, crazy expensive. expensive. Paper. I mean, I'm not saying those other, um, those other forms of marketing are not helpful. It just seems what really worked mm -hmm. has been Facebook and Instagram. Okay. And word uh, of mouth. So you uh, admittedly didn't budget in advertising dollars, which is mm -hmm. actually important. Um, were you surprised or... Were you prepared for the volume of startup costs, not just marketing, but the whole shebang? Nope. I was um, fairly clueless, <laughs> but uh, I'm a researcher at heart. I love to read. So if, if I need to know something, I'll dig in and figure it out, right? Mm -hmm. So I usually am not too worried about what I don't know. But yes, there were things I could not have anticipated. Like with, I had only, up until this point, I've owned residential property and rental property. Okay. So I had an understanding. Um, my bend is toward entrepreneurship anyway. I've always had something going. But commercial property is very different. And so, for instance, when, I, when it came to what it would cost, it's significantly more expensive to rent commercial oh, property. Yeah. And I was expecting a security deposit to be similar to um, residential, like to rental, you know, one month. Well, no, 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 no. No, it's more like three, you know? Oh, wow. So there was, yeah, there was a significant upfront cost that I just was clueless. And then contractors, I started out with one vision and I ran into a lot of challenges with contractors doing what they say they were going to do. Following up, there's some people I never did get quotes back from them. So right now, Take Aim looks very different than how I thought it was going to look. I was going to do like pony walls, uh, burnt wood bottoms, you know, and then just the fencing at the very top because I wanted a more rustic woodsy look, but I end up going with full commercial chain because that's who would do what they said they were going to do, you know, right. and, and I, I think it, it's fine. It, it's, it's not a problem, but I, it's just different. And most of this journey has been about setting a plan and then doing what you have to do to get where you need to go even if the plan needs to change. So where did the money come from? Did you have savings? Did you have to borrow? Like, did you cash so, in your 401k? Like, you yeah, know. I had savings. I, I, I did a combination of some savings that I had put for retirement and some personal savings. Okay. I did a combination of both. Um, 
And the reason why I did that is because in my 20s, I had a very difficult um, time with credit. And I just, I, my, my credit is, I just didn't want to get any debt that I just wanted to use my own money. I didn't okay. want to have to deal with the bank. And I, I didn't want, and I, I read all this stuff about uh, how banks are, can be a challenge to work with for new businesses. And I remember I went out of town the last week in March, started meeting with city planning the first week in April and take aim was open in August. So you're looking at April to August, right? April, May, June, July, August. You're looking at five months. I didn't have time for you right. to be submit this 5,000 times. Well, we'll talk, we'll think about whether or not we're going to let you have this money. And, um, and the reason why I was trying to move quickly is because I also knew that there were other um, axe throwing chains looking to come to our area. So I wanted to kind of get open. You know what I mean? You I wanted, wanted to be the first. Now, the, yes, and we do have others. And the, it's ironic because the one that I knew was coming is not the one that actually came. So anyway, so oh. were, I know, I know, I don't even know. Because we have another chain that's in Northwest Arkansas that was looking at our area and they end up not coming. So, so maybe you prevented them from coming. Or the other. You said, I'm here first. <laughs> so that's why I was like, I don't have time to wait because if right. I'm going to do this now is the time. So I use my own money and people kind of frowned at that. You know, friends were like, oh no, no, you ever use your own money. Um, I feel comfortable with how I did that. I am that's good. paying money back. That's the business is paying that money back actually. And um, so yeah, that's what I did. That actually is a good segue to um, paying yourself. How do you, how do you pay yourself? And I'm going to give you a follow-up question. Uh -huh. Your startup costs and your, your initial months, how has that changed too, in terms of, of costs currently? Okay. A couple of different things. Um, you know, I really, I have a full-time job, so I don't right. regularly collect a salary from taking aim. Um, it's, and, and I don't do that because I want to give it an opportunity to, um, you know what I'm saying? To, build the foundation it needs to sustain what new businesses have to sustain. And I forgot the term, my accountant, um, because it's an LLC, mm -hmm. basically the surplus at the end of the year essentially comes to me anyway. Okay. And I forgot what the tax term is for that. You may know, but um, anyway, draw down something down. I don't know. Just, I'll have to look it up um, and, and, and mention it to you. But, but as far as startup costs, of course, at the beginning, Lots of startup costs, right? Just the contracts, the uh, contract work. I got a thousand dollars easily worth of just backboard. It's just mm -hmm. the backboard that's the target sits on, right? Mm -hmm. um, we opened up some walls. Like I, the bathrooms was like concrete floor, dingy something. I went and bought some peel and stick tiles and laid the tile in both bathrooms myself. Um, the back room, for instance, I had to make space for my kids. So when they're with me, they can have, you know, their TV, their futon, their Roku. And all right. So there are different price, different uh, expenses at the beginning. Now our basic expenses are ax replacement, wood, right, for target replacement, but then also insurance, which I could not have imagined that the insurance, I mean, I should have imagined that it would be expensive, but it is very, very expensive. The amount of insurance that's required for this type of business, as you can imagine, because- I mean, you're insurance. throwing axes, so the insurance is, you know, gonna wanna cover that. Yeah, true story. <laughs> um, and so, um, what else were you asking me about that? Oh, oh, no, go ahead. One thing that has changed significantly, so insurance hasn't changed significantly, um, Monthly uh, wood hasn't changed, has changed the most though. So whereas I would order two by 10 by 12 foot boards and have them cut them in four foot pieces and those boards would be like $9. They were $30 at the peak of COVID, $30. So that's three times what I was paying before. Now we're down to, I just ordered some wood two weeks ago. I think now we're down to maybe 19. That's still double. That's still double. And so it's gradually coming down and they explained it to me. So there's a long process from, by the time you go to a lumber yard, this, this, you know, tree and wood and this whole process, well, COVID stopped all of that. Right. You no. Know? And so now it's a supply and demand issue because you have people building houses and, you know, and so as, as we get caught up, then I should see the number come back to normal. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I'm buying wood in very small 
batches because each time I buy it, it's a little bit cheaper. Whereas before I would buy a month supply. Well, I'm not going to buy a month supply at $22. Not at double. No, no. So I'm just buying a little bit. And People's Brothers are fantastic. They deliver, they unload, you know, they, they're amazing. But I'm just being a little bit more conservative with expenses in general. So you brought up how COVID has changed prices. What yes. else has COVID done? I mean, you, were, you probably had to shut down for a hot minute. I did. I, um, March 15th, I think was the last day in the building until the, the weekend after Memorial Day. So that end of May, beginning of June. And it's all, it was almost like, and I think I respected that because we didn't know what we were dealing with. And to keep right. everybody safe, um, I felt like that was a, the right decision. And because I did not depend on take aim for my living expenses, because I have my own job, um, and, and I hadn't taken from the surplus because we were open seven months. So by month three, take aim was paying for itself, right? By month four, it was surplus. And then when you look at November, December, it was double what was needed. And so those months kind of served as the cushion oh, to, yeah. to pay. So I never had to ask my landlord to not, because he's a small business owner himself. He doesn't own a lot of property. You know, he has a family. So I didn't ask him. I paid him all those months we were closed. I paid him all the months that we've had less crowds than usual, because um, that's important to me. And in all of that, all of that. I, I did not, not pay anything. Um, so because you're not paying yourself, you were able to keep it open a lot longer where some businesses have had to shut down. You have mm -hmm. not. I have not. Um, but I did get with SBA and I did add a small SBA loan. Okay. Um, yeah. Just during, um, I, there was like a 10,000, 2,000 was a grant and I think 10,000, something like that, something small. Um, which for me is small because I'll just gonna plan to pay it back through the business. Mm -hmm. so that's the business loan, that's not my money. So um I did do that. Um and I'm sorry I got distracted now. And you're all right. No, so where where are we at now? I, I had I had just asked how COVID had changed things and we were yes. talking about you did really well up front. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um obviously you weren't bringing in any money during the months of you know March, April, May. Yep, yep. And, and then, then when you, June was like starting over. Like okay. August was ghost town quiet because I really had done a poor job with marketing. And it's a fairly new thing to our area too. Right. Um, so June was a fraction. Like I think when I looked at the numbers, um, it was like maybe 6% of what I needed. It wasn't even 10. Right. It wasn't 10%. July was a little bit better. August was a little bit better. September was a little bit better. So October is trending to be the first month that Take Aim covers everything with a surplus. It awesome. will be small, but it will be something. So October, so we have six months there basically. So in terms of a break even number, mm -hmm. how many sales do you need or how many, I don't know if you have it broken down into sales or in hours, because when, when someone comes in and they say, I want to throw axes, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's an hour. Right. Right. So how many so, hours do you need to sell in the month? I have it broken down like this, 45, $20 throws. So, and the reason why I have it broken down like that. That's 45 we, hours though. Yes. Would that be 45 hours? Not $20 an hour? Not necessarily. Cause what if five people come in for $20? That, that would just be one hour. Oh, I see what you're saying. Uh -huh. I still would calculate in my mind an hour, but that's just oh, okay. kind of how my brain works. Because everybody's okay. buying an hour is what they're right. buying. Right. But I don't have to necessarily be open 45 hours a week. True. Because I actually, I probably average less than 20 a week. Okay. Um, so then you could break it down per person, I guess, if there's yes, no way to. people a week. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I use the $20 people is because it's an easy number. Because when you throw for two hours, you get a break, you get a $5 break. So it ends up being 35 instead of uh, 40. Okay. And then I have my military and police officers, my military first responder people. I like to give them 10% off. So they're really not a 20, um, a 20 person fair or 18, you know, that type of thing. And so that's why I said 45 people. 20. So when I look at the total number for the month, I divide it by $20. Okay. So average how many people came through. That makes complete sense. I mean, mm -hmm. and you can do that only being open part-time, which is, I think makes this even more of a success. Mm -hmm. um, 
last question and then please bring up anything that you you want mm -hmm. to mention sure um you're a mother yes you work full time mm -hmm. you've got kids in school you've mm -hmm. got this business on the side how hard is that extremely it's it's extremely challenging and some days I'm doing really good. You know, I'm all Zen and I'm like, I got this. And then some days I look Zen and I'm crazy on the inside. Right. So <laughs> it depends on the day. Um, but my girls are 17 and 12. So it helps that they're a little bit older. It helps and it doesn't help. And, and what I mean by that is because they have their own lives. I'm essentially mm -hmm. a, a chauffeur, a taxi service, ripping them, running them to their things. Um, and I want them to, of course, enjoy their life. Um, but they are also, they've been big help, you know, they help moderately, you know, when they feel mm -hmm. like it. Um, but the, I manage it by prioritizing in general, the way I see my priorities, I have 85%, 85% is my number. 85%, if I get 85% of the things done that I want to do in a day, I feel successful. And that's important to me. I feel like, okay, I got, I got this handled. Um, so I was speaking with another um, mom who's a business owner last week, and I love how she put this too. She says, some of your priorities are plastic and some of them are glass. Don't drop the glass. The plastic can hit the floor. And that's essentially what, when I say 85 Well put. Isn't it? And so I have the things very clearly in the forefront of my mind that cannot drop. My girls, my house has to run a certain way for me to feel good about life. Um, and so there's a lot of things I just don't take on. You know, I, I have been in my past. I've been the person soon as someone say, hey, I need I'm like, I can help you with that. Right. I do that a lot less, you know, um, and I communicate very directly when people expect me to be places that I know I'm not going to be able to be. You know what I'm saying? That's not beneficial to where I'm going. So. So, yeah, and I don't know if you caught, but I, I turned one of the back rooms in the building into a hangout space for the girls because I don't want them home alone. I want them with me. Right. Um, and so I make that room uh, a friendly place for them as much as I can. Um, and so, yeah, and now that they're older, they their agenda is being built up. They may walk across the street to the plaza and sit on the swings. And so, yeah. I, so I think it's a great area too. We did. I don't know that even we've even said that it's in Argenta yet, but mm -hmm. I think it. I think even though you're a block off from Main Street, I think everything that's going on downtown these days, mm -hmm. uh, you can go throw some axes and go grab some dinner under mm -hmm. one of the tents or mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. sit and swing or. Mm -hmm. I think there's opportunity there as it grows. It is, and you know, pre-COVID, there were a lot of plans for that plaza. There were going to be movie nights and all this. So once we get past this season, you know, that we're in, I expect it to be even a better um, mm -hmm. location than it is right now. And it was actually the deciding factor. I looked at a lot of space. I looked way in Sherwood, out by Whole Hog. I looked, I looked because I I lived in Sherwood for four years, and I really liked that area. I looked off JFK because Park Hill is really growing. But at the end of the day, as a mom. I picked that area because I had the Innovation Hub so I can get the girls mm -hmm. memberships for after school. I'm literally one block from the Innovation Hub. They get tired of being with me. They can go fiddle. Right. Um, they're both huge library lovers. Our gentle library is one block from me as well. Um, they will walk because I, you know, I have a 17-year-old. They'll walk and go get them something to eat and then come mm -hmm. back. And so that, that location was part of my survival. It's 15 minutes from my house less than 15 minutes from my house, less than 15 minutes from my job, and less than 15 minutes from both my girls' school. And so that was on purpose. <laughs> That's an excellent location then. Yeah. Um, last question. Uh -huh. When do you think, let me, re let me rephrase, how will you know when Take Aim has been successful? Uh -huh. That's a very complicated conversation that we could mm -hmm. really talk about. I've had this conversation with people who are super close to me for me, Take Aim has already succeeded. And I know that you say, how can you say that? Like, no, not like, at all. I think everyone's definition of success is different. Yes. So when I embarked on this, I was at a really interesting time in my life. And um, I was looking at going back to school to get my doctorate. I love learning. I love higher ed. And I, in the, and I really credit the program, the doctorate program that I was in for, it was a fantastic program. And it just expanded my capacity for what I really wanted for myself. And um, what Take Aim has done for me has reignited my commitment to entrepreneurship. 
at the end of the day, whether it's take aim or something else, I'm going to be running something right. because ultimately that's what I think is a better fit for me. I'm thankful for my career. Um, and I've had some amazing job opportunities and I'm in a, in a great one right now, but I know traditional employment, I'm on, I'm on borrowed time right. for that, for me. Mm-hmm. And so this has, um, cause you know, you go through things in life and I think sometimes I wouldn't say I settled, but I got comfortable with a, just enough. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. But take aim has, um, we go through a lot of things in life, right? And in those things, you look back on some of them and you say, I would not do that again. I would not do that again. That mm-hmm. was the best. But with all of the craziness of getting open, petitioning and committees and councils and explaining and re-explaining, getting open, being slow, then ramping up and being so busy that I was crazy, like having to pull somebody in, like I need help because I can't even run all of this right now. Um, then being shut down. So all these things that I've just explained to you that I've been through. I would still do it again because of what it has given me personally. Like I don't even have words to really explain what it has done for me um, in, in, in my commitment to be myself. Does that make right. sense? Mm-hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. So anyway, it does. so for me, Take Aim has given me what I needed that I didn't set out to get from it, right? I'm just mm-hmm. thinking opportunity, right? but it gave me something so interpersonal that it transcended opportunity, right? That's awesome. And so now I'm, of course, going to keep the opportunity going, but I can't lose now because I already got what I needed from taking. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I don't know how long this video is, but I'm going to tell you a short story and I'll be fast. Is Please. that okay? Uh-huh. So I went to the University of Missouri, Columbia, Mizzou. Um, and uh, when I was a student, I worked for these, these young brothers. They were brothers, bio brothers both in the College of Education, they bought tickets to high demand concerts. I remember like Janet Jackson was one, Voice Men. They bought these tickets and they resold them. And the name of their business was Tiger Tickets. So their parents sent them to school to get their degrees in education, but they had created this side business. Right. So in the 90s, they paid us $10 an hour. We used the campus computer lab. This is so crazy. It ain't right. I'm just telling you what we did. Hey, you're getting no judgment I worked for from them. Me. They paid us ten dollars an hour, and all we did was. And back in the I, '90s, ten dollars an hour was a big deal. It was good money, right? Right. My work study was five fifteen. Ex- anyway, same. This weekend money, I was, I was like, yeah. They gave us credit cards. We bought these tickets, and they resold them. They grew because I'm a Mizzou Tiger, right? Tiger tickets. They grew Tiger tickets so big that Ticketmaster bought them out. Yep. They took the money from that and built um, VA home loans, the largest mortgage company of VA loans in the country. Oh, wow. Yep. Now, Tiger Tickets wasn't the thing that got them where they are now. Right. Extremely, extremely well off. And for their parents, they finished their degree in education. Never. Anyway. Right. But Tiger Tickets was a vehicle to get them to Mm -hmm. VA home loans, okay? So I say all that to say, when I say I got what I needed from Take Aim, I don't know if Take Aim is gonna be the thing or the thing that leads to the thing, but at this point, it doesn't matter. Right. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's a great story, actually. Oh, you can look up the Bukowski brothers. I'm gonna call them and tell them I know you. (laughs) Well, will they remember me? I don't know. Find out. Yeah, I know, right? I did work for them when they owned Tiger Tickets anyway, but they were babies. They were babies. They were older than me at 19, but they were like young 20s. Mm -hmm. But to have the vision and the foresight to do what they have done. So Mm -hmm. that's awesome. That's a great story. Yeah. One final question, then we're going to go. What one goal do you hope to have for Take Aim? Okay, that's a good question. Right now, of course. I want a minimum of a hundred people a week coming through the door every week. Okay. A minimum. And um, you said your break even was 45 a week? Mm-hmm. Okay. I want a minimum of a hundred people coming through a week. And I want to find, um, I want to help build my team. Okay. Because in order for taking to expand, I have to get some good people. 
And that's hard to know because when people leave, they're happy. I work hard, like customer service is critical. We mm-hmm. want people to have fun. We, I mean, what I what I value most right now about Take Aim is that I have a spot that people come and enjoy their people. You know, right. we go 90 miles an hour, super crazy busy all week, but you, you can come to my space and just have a good time with your people, right? Mm-hmm. And that's important to me. I need, I need people who can do that, who I can trust not to steal. <laughs> I mean, all these things you think Obviously. about business owner, right? Yeah got to make sure people are being safe. We don't have any accidents, you know, we are safe. And so building a team, a strong team that I can trust with my business, with the brand of my business, like I can actually not worry about it. And then of course, getting people in the door. Okay. I wrote down your goals actually. So oh, um, you. you're welcome. Um, let's stop there. And we okay. may, we may meet again in the future and do some follow-up, but okay. um, I appreciate you joining us. Um, and, um, I was going to say nice to meet your class, but obviously I won't meet them, but yeah, um, COVID and online and all of that. So, but but thank you for coming. And if the students have a question, um, I'll probably just email them to you and, and we can, and if we need to do this again, we can. Absolutely. Anytime. Thank you. Students are my people too. All right. That's right. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.